What is OO? The first thing we need to talk about are the abbreviations OO and OOP. OO stands for Object Orientation. OOP stands for Object Oriented Programming. I will sometimes use the abbreviation OO and sometimes OOP, but for us in this training, they mean the same thing. What does object oriented programming mean? You already know what programming is. Programming is telling the computer what to do. Orientation literally means direct to the east, but here it means focused. So object oriented programming is programming that is focused on objects. Great! The only problem is that this does not help us to understand OO. Maybe the official definition will help us. There we have our first problem. There are many official definitions. Let's look at what Wiki says. Object Oriented Programming OOP, is a programming paradigm based on the concept of objects which can contain data and code. Objects sometimes correspond to things found in the real world. Hmm, that is not helping us any further. Perhaps it might help to look at the features of OO. Python is not the only OO language. Many modern languages are object oriented and they all share certain features. OO features are encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. Yeah, we've hit an educational problem. If you don't understand something, it is not very helpful to explain with more stuff you don't understand. It took me 20 years of programming before I understood what object-oriented programming is. That does not need to be a problem. I've made a large amount of websites, games and apps and they were all programmed with OO languages. I knew what OO did, I just did not know how it worked. You are watching this so it won't take you 20 years to understand how OO works. I wished someone had told me early in my career what programming challenges are solved with OO. I've had challenges enough in all those years. And I noticed there are things that always happen when you are programming. Code always grows and code always changes. Let me show you a typical example of what happens. In Python, you usually start with a single script to test if your idea works. But the script grows and soon it's becoming hard to read. When the size of the script increases, you break up the script into smaller parts to improve readability. Each new part goes into a new Python file. These parts are called modules. When modules start to grow, they can be split into smaller modules. The goal at this point is to improve readability, but you are also starting to notice you are creating modules for specific things. Employee stuff goes into the employee module, printing reports goes into the reporting module, etc. Splitting up code and putting it where it belongs is called refactoring and is common practice for programmers in all programming languages. You can safely say that refactoring is a big part of software engineering because code always grows and code always changes. Your application keeps growing and you create more and more modules. In fact, you're having so much fun, you're putting almost every line of code in its own module. It certainly makes the code very readable. But there is a villain in our story. The villain is called dependency. How do we manage that all these modules work together? When module A uses something from module B, we say that module A has a dependency on module B. If you split up code without a plan, you end up with many modules with random dependencies. 
In this diagram, pretty much all the modules have dependencies on each other. We call it spaghetti code. When too many small modules cause dependency problems, wouldn't it be better to sacrifice a bit of readability and combine some of the code in larger modules? It turns out there's another problem with large modules, aside from poor readability. Let's say you create module A that combines the functionality for customer management and a newsletter service. Whenever something changes in the newsletter service, there is the risk to break something in the customer management and vice versa. We say that module A has more than one responsibility. Module A will change for more than one reason. Why is this a problem? Let me explain this to you with a true story. In 2018, a huge bridge over a river in Berlin was replaced with a new one. How do you replace a bridge? You cut the old one and you put a new one in. Let's divert all traffic and cut the bridge. We are good to go. One hour later, 30,000 households had no power for the next days. It turned out that the bridge was also used for the power lines. Since the bridge was old, people had forgotten about that little fact. You expect cars to cross bridges. Perhaps many years ago, it seemed like a good idea to also use the bridge for power lines. Only to find out in 2018 that you have a huge problem. And here is the morale of the story. If you combine things that do not really belong together, the risk of breaking stuff when you need to change something increases. If you couple a bridge with power lines, it becomes really hard to change one thing without affecting the other. Sometimes it even becomes impossible to change one thing without breaking the other thing. This is true for bridges, but also for code. The fewer reasons things have to change, the less risk you have. Change is dangerous. That's why it makes sense to create small modules that have a single responsibility. Single responsibility means that things should only have a single reason to change. Regardless if all code is in one big file or scattered over many small modules, when code is not well organized, it will suffer from two important problems. Rigidity and fragility. Rigid code is code that is so tightly coupled that a small change in one part of the system forces you to make massive changes in other parts of the system, just like our bridge. Fragile code is code where a small change in one part of the system breaks other parts, even if the parts seem to be unrelated to each other. There are certain indicators that tell us we are dealing with rigid and or fragile code. These indicators are Duplicate code Duplicate code is the same code that appears in more than one place. Coupling Coupling means that code is so tightly connected to other code, it becomes hard or impossible to change code without causing major changes in the system. Single responsibility says that a module should only have one reason to change. Perhaps you have worked on software where one module constantly had to be changed for all sorts of reasons. If you notice that happens, that module is probably doing too many things and is violating the single responsibility principle. The last indicator might sound funny. How can if-else statements be bad code? I'm not talking about checking if someone is over 18 years old or checking if someone is logged in. So when are if-else blocks an indicator for fragile code? 
when they perform different actions based on different object types. There will be a good example of this in the exercise we will make together. Back to our villain. We know that an unorganized system will cause rigid and fragile code. It is very important to structure our code and manage dependencies. How do you prevent dependencies exploding into all directions? You can solve this problem with a dependency tree. Here it is easy to see how the modules depend on each other. Organizing code is the art to find the right tree structure. Why is organizing code so important? Because code that is well organized tends to behave well and stay correct even if we know that. Code always grows and code always changes. Our goal is to find out where all the code belongs in this tree. This is a task that gets easier the more experience you have. So where does OO come in? Object-oriented programming helps us to put code where it belongs. Together we will practice this. By the time we are done, you have a toolbox that you can use to create object-oriented programs. The toolbox contains objects, classes, inheritance, encapsulation, polymorphism and composition. You will know what tool you can use to solve common programming problems. At the end of each chapter, you will see which tools we have used. It is important to know that solving problems can be done with one or more tools. And using one tool can solve one or more problems. Only experience will tell you what is the best tool to solve a particular problem. What will be different when you start writing your programs in an object-oriented way? The simplest way to put it is, you will stop writing large programs and use the tools that OO gives you to split up your code and create modular applications. Modular applications are readable, testable, and if something goes wrong or you want to change things, you just have to work in one module instead of changing things throughout the code. This makes changes to the system a lot less risky. If you have organized your code well, you can even swap out complete modules without major risks. To get back to the question from the beginning, what is OO? If you would ask me for my definition of OO, it would be OO is about structuring modules to prevent rigid and fragile code.